Okay, so this is lecture 15. So at the first step of our lecture 15, I made a Q&A session with you about our the last homework and you gave me many valuable uh, questions, uh, so unexpected and it was uh, uh, very pleasant to surprise you to me. So thank you for your questions. And now we wanted to talk about the remaining lecture contents in lecture 14. So lecture 15 is just a continuation of our previous lecture 14. No. What was our previous lecture? So our previous lecture was devoted to the derivation of continuity equation. So continuity equation of what? So which quantity was? So electron density. At the time, we have derived that the electron continuity equation can be written as this form. So yes. So simply speaking, if electrons are escaping from a certain position, then that will introduce net decrease the number or density of electron. That's it. So this is quite intuitive and quite straightforward. However, what we did in the previous lecture was starting from our governing equation BT, try to derive the continuity equation. That was our lecture content in the previous lecture. And you know that actually there was not many um, approximation involved with the continuity equation. Of course, we had introduced something like uh, some about band structure, but such an um, approximation can be easily relaxed because you know, continuity equation itself is uh, quite much related with basic, basic physical law, just counting the numbers. So you should be valid in general cases. So, so BT, uh, the fact that we can derive continuity equation from the Boltzmann equation actually is not a surprise. So we should be able to derive the continuity equation from the Boltzmann transport equation. So there is, will be no contradiction between them. So, however, today we will talk about the derivation of an expression for current density, electron current density, Jn. So, as you will find, Actually, the derivation of J sub n is not as straightforward as uh, the continuity equation. This is because it contains more terms and all of them are not easy to be simplified. If we allow the general notation, then life is quite simple. For example, if we try to think about the time derivative of J sub n, n, then we will have a lot of terms, many many terms generated by the, uh, the average on the momentum space. We will have a lot of terms and if we define each of them as a new physical quantities, okay, this term, let's call it as A and let's call it as B, C, D, E, then our task would be quite simple. Just to define new quantity, yeah, that's it. But point is, in our strategy, our goal is just to express all of our quantities just a function of n or electric field. That's the point. So instead of defining a new quantity called A, B, C, D, E, but we wanted to express it as a function of n and electric field. n and electric field, everything should be written as function of n or function of e. Here, e is electric field. 
since our strategy is so ambitious, of course, uh, in rigorous sense, it is not possible. However, we anyhow make a certain approximation, plenty of approximation to make it possible. So please note that today's lecture is not as rigorous as the previous one, the lecture 14, because our first trial itself is too ambitious. Okay? But anyhow, please note that although after, after we have covered lecture 15, your feeling about this content would be, oh, this is uh, too much approximated expression. So maybe this is too inaccurate in my sense. So therefore, I don't like it. But please keep in mind that, okay, you may have your feeling about that equation, but please understand this is the de facto standard equation to be solved. So although that is not perfect, but everybody is solving that equation with well-calibrated quantities. So it is practically very important and understanding the limitation and value of this equation is quite important. So let's go to the current density equation. So main motivation for us to think about current density is the current itself or the current, our ultimate output value is just obtained by the electron current density over a certain area. So this is a certain area called contact. And if we integrate the current density over contact area, then we will get the terminal current for that contact. I mean that here we have a certain area. And if we integrate the current density over this area, then we will call this integrated quantity as a, the current, which has the unit of ampere. Of course, J sub n, this one has the unit of ampere per square centimeter. This is a per uh, area quantity and when we make integration over area contact area then we will get the quantity corresponding to the pure ampere okay so since our ultimate quantity of interest is current and that current is commonly related with the current density so we wanted to understand current density. Hmm. How can we calculate this quantity? If we are interested with the dynamic of electron density, we had to integrate the Boltzmann equation because um, Boltzmann equation has the terms like this. So time derivative of distribution function and if we just integrate our electron distribution function f over the momentum space, then we will have the electron density. Oh, that was the coverage in our previous lecture. So if we are interested with time derivative of j sub n, then maybe we wanted to try to a certain quantity which can yield j sub n when integrated. I mean that, what is the quantity? Think about a certain quantity and if we just integrate that quantity over momentum space, then now we have oh, jn. 
we wanted to identify a certain quantity whose momentum integration is j sub n. That is point. Uh -huh. However, we can remember that this is j sub n is closely related with flux. And if you come back to our previous lecture contents, then you can remember that so j sub n is corresponding to what we call this quantity and velocity times f. That was our previous definition on electron flux. Aha! Therefore, now you can understand if we integrate velocity group velocity times f and with, um, with certain coefficient n minus q, then it will give us the j sub n over our quantity of interest. Okay? So, that's the reason why ah, if we integrate velocity times f over momentum space, then we will get j sub n or f sub n. So that's the reason why instead of just integrating our Boltzmann equation without any weighting factor, but now we wanted to first multiply velocity to left hand side and right hand side of our Boltzmann equation. So this is the Boltzmann equation multiplied by velocity. Mm -hmm. So you know that uh, the original Boltzmann equation itself has a scalar form. However, since we have multiplied a vector to the left hand side or and right hand side, so you know that this is a vector and this is also a vector a vector also a vector scattering itself is interpreted as a scalar form and you know this is velocity a vector mm -hmm. so after that we just take the integration. So integration simply means that so three-dimensional volume integration in the momentum space and just adding a leading coefficient to make it a count and yeah, so that's it. Then what will happen to our Boltzmann equation? As you can see here, now it becomes time derivative of this quantity. Time derivative of this, this quantity is nothing but just electron flux. Okay, now you can easily understand it becomes the electron flux and its time derivative is given by these three terms. One, two and three terms oh hmm. since we have here velocity velocity and velocity the equation is not as simple as the previous case previously in the case of uh, continuity equation we had no weighting factor but Unfortunately, now we have weighting factor. For example, without this velocity, then without this velocity, this integration gave us just number zero. But now we have non-zero, non-zero output for this integration. The easiest thing is just to define it as a, a new quantity. Let's call it as Vs, for example. Then everything will be quite easy and mathematically just 
just to equivalent and nothing new. But our aim is to express this quantity as a function of, for example, electron density, electric field, or, for example, since we have introduced F sub n, so another way is mm, expressed in terms of F sub n. Then everybody will happy because you know mm, yeah so here we have um, f sub n whose dynamics is given by this equation and n electrons electron density dynamics is given by our continuity equation and electric field electric field itself is given by the Poisson equation so these three quantities has its own equation so now we can build a closed set of equation that is our aim so hmm so let's start our journey to get those expressions of course as i told you before this cannot be without approximation we have to introduce many approximations into it okay Mm. let's consider the third term first here third term means that the terms related with electric force mm. previously what it did was just to taking the integration by part so by taking the integration by part we had we were able to kick out this uh, term However, since now we have the velocity, it is no longer possible. So we have to think about what we have to do. So think about this one. As I told you before, all of them, all of them are vector quantities. So um, to me, it was so difficult to understand. So since I was uh, not quite uh, familiar with tensor notation, so instead of that, I just uh, decomposed into every element, so directional element. So please, please try to follow my primitive basic uh, derivation. But I think that that is um, enough for our lecture course. So since this is a vector, why don't you consider a certain direction? For example, let's say that we have x, y, z. Let's consider a certain direction, x directional component, y directional component, and z directional component. If we ask what is x directional component of this integrand, then what will be your answer? You know that this is just a scalar. So uh, the x directional component is simply given by x directional velocity. Its direction is only given by this term. And now we have 1 over hava f. f. Mm -hmm. That is quite easy. And y direction, yes. So same, exactly same, g direction, that is exactly same. So our integration can be decomposed into in this way. Mm. Let's say this is x direction and y direction and z direction. And just taking the integration of our scalar integrand over our momentum space and we can repeat it three times then we will have all a uh, result okay so therefore i'm now saying that let's consider certain direction x sub i this x sub i can be either x y or z so please interpret our for example v sub i either 
vx, vy, vz. So then, now we can say summation of i, x, y, z, and their unit direction. That will give us actually the third term. So although we have to calculate that third term in this way, we assume that we understand this one. This summation over i and having the unit direction for each direction is understood. And now we can just consider this directional integration. And the integrand is just a scalar function. Hmm. That is easy, even to me. And now let's go to the next step. So in this case, pulling out our electric force is straightforward because you know this electric force is nothing related with the momentum space. So we can easily pull out it. However, now unfortunately we have the velocity. This velocity is not easy to, uh, because velocity itself is a, a sole function of really the momentum. So although we have assumed that velocity does not depend on the position, yeah, we have introduced an assumption of a position independent band structure. However, still, it really depends on the momentum. So we cannot pull it out. So we have to do the following thing. Here now we have something like this. So let me just move rigorously. Here, this one can be written as 1 over hava at time v i and k f. Fortunately, this 1 over half r f times dot product, this is not related with momentum, so we can put it out here. Here, we can find it. And now we have to think about integration of this quantity. So this quantity, if we have to integrate v i d k d k then what we have to do is also just taking it so integrate v i f d k minus now the f times v i d k this is just a vector identity, so we just uh, apply it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now, just like our previous uh, assumption, at the zone boundary, now f itself goes to zero. Of course, velocity at the zone boundary go to infinity in our approximation. But you know, f at John boundary, that is vanishing. Also, that is exponentially vanishing, and this is just uh, polynomially increasing. So this one, overall, this one goes rapidly approaching to zero at John boundary. So we believe that this term does not contribute at all. However, this term really contributes, and you know, in this case, we, we were able to fool um, gradient over a certain quantity, so we were able to make it the boundary value problem. But here, we have just uh, still momentum space integration, so unfortunately, we have to keep it here. So, now we have the kept result like this. As you can see, here we have a velocity 
and its uh, gradient. It gives you a vector, and here again you have a vector, so their dot product gives you a scalar. Mm -hmm. So everything is quite uh, simple, and now we find that there occurs an unknown quantity like this here. We have a certain quantity like this. Mm. What is it? It is very difficult to, to be expressed as a function of electron density or electric field and even F sub n. This is more related with our band structure itself. So you know that this is the group velocity. And group velocity is the uh, material property. And this group velocity is once again deriv derived with respect to our momentum value. So this is, in principle, not related with our transport parameters. This is related with our band structure. So instead of trying to express it as a function of electron density, electric field, or F sub n, we will just call it as a material parameter, and we call it at inverse mass. So this is, this is, this quantity is defined as an inverse mass. Mm, here, could you please have a look at it? Here, now we have this term. Actually, this vi and its gradient, this one gives you oh, another vector. But you know, here we have f, so f can have fx, fy. Z. And this vector will have also terms like this, mm -hmm. x directional and derivation with respect to kx and y, vi, ky, and z. I, K, Z. Since we have a dot product between F and this gradient, the product will give you certain quantities. F, X, and round V, I, round K, X. Plus F, Y, round V, I, over round K, Y. And finally, Fz round Vi over Kz. So, by introducing another summation, then, for example, J, then I can make a compact form. Of course, J runs over x, y, over z. Then we can say Fj and round vi over round kj. That is a compact form for this dot product. And this is written here and there. Now let's identify the inverse mass. So here, let me just clean up this one. Clean up, clean up. Okay, then let me just write write it down clearly here. Now we have here a new direction J and F J. 1 over cube over 2 pi 
and integration over 1 over hapa and v i v k j f and integration over our momentum space and when you make a comparison with my own writing and PowerPoint here then you can find that I have introduced the inverse mass in that way for example let's make a one-to-one -one correspondence between our result here fj fj coefficient coefficient here here and f dk f dk and minus minus summation summation and you can easily understand now the way i did define the inverse mass is simply given by 1 over haba and v i and k j please note that once again this i and j denote the direction so it can be x y g and x y g so if we make a certain realization for example we can define m x x inverse as like this 1 over half bar and v x and k x so z z can be have a 1 over half bar round v z round k z so these quantities are diagonal so x x y y z z you can easily understand they are existing in our inverse mass so for example think about this quite a simple expression and maybe you can really understand if we write down energy like a square haba to m x x k x square haba to m y y k g square and haba to m z z oh sorry i made a mistake here y and k g square so from this band structure please try to find out the inverse mass component so can you do it so first of all what you have to do is uh, find out the group velocity so how can we calculate the group velocity do you remember the group velocity um, so x directional group velocity is simply given by 1 over haba and partial derivative of our energy with respect to x mm -hmm. so if we so for arbitrary direction v j then you can have round e over round k j so then mm, that give you really simple understanding so i will write down here m i j n is given by by definition it is 1 over haba round v i over round k j of j but since our group velocity itself is given by 1 over haba round e over round k i why do we have i here because here we have i so simply speaking our 
inverse mass with the index of ij can be expressed as second derivative of our energy with respect to once for ki and once for kj. Mm -hmm. So simply speaking, once again, mxx inverse can be written as 1 over half a square and second derivative our energy with respect to kx. So mzz also can be written as 1 over half a square and e k g square. So you can easily find it in uh, your definition on inverse mass. Okay, so please remember this expression. Inverse mass is given by this term. Mm -hmm. Then natural question is, mm, uh, well, x and y can be either x, y, z and x, y, z. So not only m, x, x, but we can also think about m, x, y. Then how about this? m, x, y. Let's consider m, x, y. If we have this kind of uh, anisotropic effective mass approximation, then if you calculate F, if you try to if you try to take the second derivative with respect to kx and ky, then what will happen to your result. In this case, we have no terms which contain both of kx and ky. No such term. So it will give you just number 0. Oh, therefore, you can easily understand for this simple band structure we have assumed up to now, we only have m x x inverse which is given by just 1 over m x x and m y y inverse m z z inverse this is just a directional effective mass and all other terms like m x y m y z or m z x they are you can easily find it. So of course, this holds only for this simple band structure. If we go to a more complicated band structure like a silicon balance band, then you can have of course um, the op-diagonal terms like mxy, myz, and mzz, zx. So you can have it. But in this uh, derivation, you can easily find that we have made an effective mass approximation on it. So we have made such an approximation. OK, and time is up. And although we have not covered all the material at the end of this seven year but i will just stop here so if you are interested please have a look at our previous lecture 13.5 i there without any um skipping i just explain all of our lecture contents and from next lecture lecture 16 we will just go to the real implementation of our 
strictly depend on occasion. So I think that it is mandatory for you to watch the lecture 13.5. In the next lecture, we will just start implementation of drift diffusion equation. Thank you and see you this Wednesday. Bye.